Can, can you hear me in Beijing? Uh, Chuan, Luis, Sen, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, okay, so we are starting now the um, the second half of the summer school, and today is kind of a transition day uh, between the two, and um, it we, has become a tradition in the last couple of years to have one talk by an experimental neuroscientist while the other lecturers are theorists. And we're very happy today to have Sylvia Arbor um, uh, fill this role. Be before I say a, a word about Sylvia, just two quick announcements. First of all, Manish second lecture will be building up on his uh, previous lecture and he's going to continue discussing cognitive questions, but he very kindly offered also to give an extra lecture on more the neural aspect, uh, discussing neural population codes and neural representations. And we've scheduled this extra lecture on Saturday from five to six. So please, uh, thank you. So please uh, have it in your schedule. Maybe we send a reminder email. So you have at least one enthusiastic uh, auditor. And the other announcement, I just thought we should all thank again, Ruben, who's leaving uh, today. So thank you very much for the lectures, the presence, the discussion. Okay, I could make a very long introduction, I'm sorry. I, I want to prefer to make it short so Sylvia can uh, 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 but with Sylvia, it's very easy to introduce her. You can take all the citations for the prices, collect them, and that's a, a long introduction. It's actually too long because she had too many prizes, so it will be much too long. So I will just cite, uh, mention the citation for uh, one of the prizes she got this year, which is the Brain Prize that said that she re revolution what, what was it revolutionized our understanding of neuronal cell type and circuits for understanding motor behavior thing was something like this. I right? don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we're very glad to have a revolutionary, please. Thanks, Rama. It's, it's great to be here. Um, and it's, it's um, a small enough crowd that I would really like you to encourage you to ask questions throughout the talk. I can give a talk. I could give a talk for the whole duration, but I think it will be much more fruitful if we discuss and you interrupt while we go on. As I, as I get it, this is the only true experimental talk that you have in the whole week. And I think that for me, it's actually a real pleasure to talk to theorists and computational people, because I think one thing that you guys should Really take on board is that when you think of computation or modeling of, of neuronal circuits, you should never forget the real circuits. And what is really special about the nervous system is the enormous diversity of cell types that there is. And that is why and how a brain can work. And at least from the very, very, very little that I know about computational models, the problem I often have with these models is that they just take a neuron or 10 neurons and say they're all connected with each other or make, make some rules that they then follow. And that is the sort of entry level into, into models. That's good starting point, but I think now is the time for non-experimentalists to engage with the experimentalists and to realize that there are actually some topics where one really already knows, you know, how many cell types how they are connected, what is the specificity of connections that can go into your models and that in turn would then help the experimentalists to design experiments to probe your predictions. And, and this is, I think, something that um, many of you should be thinking about, probably have thought about and is going into your, your thinking. But the talk today should give you some you know, information on how experiments can actually reveal cell types and link the cell types to function. And in my lab, we study movement because we work with animals. And in essence, the whole output that you can score from animals because they cannot talk to you is movement. So any assay, even if it's a very highly cognitive assay, will have as a readout, a behavioral readout, and that is movement. 
And so the entry point into, into what we would like to understand is how an animal and hopefully also humans, because these nervous systems are highly conserved, can actually move in so many different ways. And I often, you know, most, most of my talks start with um, this slide, which illustrates the enormous should be a, a sort of proxy to illustrate in how many different ways your body can move. And you move all the time. I mean, essentially every second of your life, you're moving. As I watch you, every one of you is moving all the time. Um, breathing is also a movement. So there's there's everything you do is is movement. And and I'm I'm fascinated by the question of how does the nervous system bring about these different versions of movements in in accord of what you actually want to do. And you can do thousands of movements, but you only do one movement at a time or two. You know, you look on your phone while you walk, but you can't do hundred movements at the same time. And that in part has, uh, you know, biomechanical constraints because you can use your limbs only for one thing and you can't do two different things with, with your, your hand. Um, then also, you know, that is a problem that <clears throat> has also impacts a lot on, on all sorts of diseases. And it, it sort of illustrates to you that the control of movement or behavior is not something that you have one movement center and that is responsible for these body movements, but that it's a distributed and systems level type problem because the, almost all diseases of the nervous system, even if they're not primarily affecting the motor system, have um, behavioral outputs that you can see. When you see these people, even if they have you know, Alzheimer's, you can, you can see that they don't move the way that a healthy person would move anymore. So many diseases, even if they don't primarily affect what you would call the motor centers of the nervous system, have, a, have an impact on, on movement. And uh, Here are just a few examples. This is a neurodevelopmental disorder, Rett syndrome. Then Parkinson's is a, neuro, a neurodegenerative disorder. ALS is when motor neurons degenerate. And then, of course, also when you have an injury to the spinal cord or a stroke, you, you can have strong impact on, on how you move. And... Our work really aims at understanding what are the cell types and the connections between these cell types um, that are at the center to actually generate diverse body movements. Now, sort of a top level into, into the, the nervous system is that many movements and actually many paradigms that experimentalists use with animals um, depend on sensation. So you sort of give an experimental animal a sensory cue that's picked up and that is then processed through the nervous system and eventually leads to a motor output. Um, that, can be, that can be anything from, you know, you certainly know these experiments, for example, with monkeys that they, they, they do saccades, that's an eye movement, or a monkey taking a, a joystick and having to do a directional movement mice doing cognitive tasks and depending on what they think they do go to one port or another there's, there's endless variants of that but um, many of the of the things are influenced by senses our, in our lives also many things are influenced by by sensation um, but of course we like to think that many things are also influenced by our thoughts that don't have a, a primary sensory input to drive them so Sort of, I actually sometimes get asked, you know, what, where is the, how do thoughts make it to a movement? And I don't think that is very well understood yet, probably in part because experimental animals, you can't really make to think. That, that might be something that would be more better, better suited to study in humans um, when you can actually really formulate that you think you don't have a sensory input, but you actually want to do something from your own thoughts. Most experimental animal sort of sessions are, are involving these sensation, sensory cues. Now, for the sensory inputs, um, you might know that one actually knows a lot more than about the other end of the nervous system, the motor outputs. For the sensory systems, it's actually very clear that there are 
very specific types of neurons that have highly specific connections. Well, a key example is, for example, the ol olfactory system, where the olfactory neurons that you have in your olfactory epithelium in the mouse, there is about a thousand. Each one expresses a different receptor and projects to one particular glomerulus. And there is a code for this, and that it's it's highly programmed. So I think, you know, probably so you as, as computational um scientists, many of you might think that experience and plasticity plays a key role. It certainly does. But I think the blueprint of the nervous system is something that's laid down by genetics and cell types that are generated during development. And then on top of this comes experience and comes shaping through plasticity mechanisms. So sort of to understand the blueprint and the highways and, and all the little roads that are put in place by development is what you know might be a good starting point for some of your models. And then on top of this, ask what happens with experience and plasticity. So on the on as I was mentioning, the, the motor output question then is has been much less um, approachable. And, and the reason for this is that it's not a one-way street in, but it's not a one-way street out. There are many streets to movement. And, and um, it's a distributed network problem, which has made it very difficult to tackle. And one really needed some new methodology for this to begin to be actually possible to, to look at. Now, then talking about which parts of the nervous system do we need to move? You haven't, haven't actually, I think, heard much about the organization of the nervous system. You certainly know when you're interested in neuroscience, but for body movements, what you know what is key is, is the spinal cord. This is sort of the output um, system that makes you move your body, your limbs, your axial mus muscles, the posture. And I often compare, compare this to an engine um, that if you don't have the spinal cord working, you can't actually make your body parts move. But you also know that if you have a spinal cord injury and a patient is paralyzed, then below that injury, that person is essentially not able to move. So an engine alone doesn't, doesn't do much. And what, so what it is that actually makes the spinal cord be able to do that is the inputs that come from the brain. And these synaptic inputs are responsible to shape these diverse motor outputs. And so you can give in the analogy to the car, you can give it a direction where you want to drive. You can give it a speed, how fast you want to drive. And all of that impinges on these networks. So what exactly the synaptic inputs are and how that is interacting with the circuits was for a long time really unknown. And, and meanwhile, we begin to, because we understand the cell types, understand that there are some pathways that really send a directional signal, that really send a sort of speed signal. And, and one can, by actually understanding the genetics and the connectivity of these populations, enter them. And so the, the idea is, of course, that the long run, one can also enter these neurons to cure for example, diseases where people are no longer able to initiate walking, one can say, okay, if, if, we, if one is able to develop tools that work in humans, that might be a way to reinstall the possibility to move. That's a long way to go, but I think sort of this avenue of personalizing the medicine according to cell types is really some, something that goes beyond what people can currently so I was mentioning to you that a key way into understanding um, these pathways that communicate between the brain and the spinal cord was the develop of, development of methodology. In our case, this was a methodology that was developed um, by the lab of Ed Callaway with, with Konzelmann in, in Germany. And, and this is a methodology that uses rabies virus, which uh, is genetically modified in such a manner that the virus um, no longer is capable of spreading on its own. It's essentially the vaccination strain. Do, do you guys know about rabies virus, how it works? No, but you you know, <laughs> we have, you said you know. 
A little bit. Okay. But anyway, so you, you know that the rabies virus, when, when, you know, when you're not vaccinated and you get bitten by a dog uh, that has rabies is something dangerous. And it, it is something dangerous because the, the non, uh, you know, vaccine strain of the rabies actually has the feature of, you know, you get bitten in a muscle the virus gets taken up by the axons that go from the spinal cord to the muscle, the motor neurons, and then it jumps over the synapses into the nervous system. And every cell that gets infected by this virus gets killed. So eventually, because everything, as, as you guys put in your model, is somehow connected with everything, uh, eventually the entire nervous system will be totally damaged and that's why it's such a, a bad thing to be to be um, bitten by some by a dog that has has rabies but these rabies viruses have been modified in a way that they actually can't do this synaptic jumping anymore and you can then use other tools either genetics or another non-lethal virus to complement this ability that they have lost so you give it back the ability to jump, but that virus no longer goes through many, many, many connections, but it just goes one synapse back. So, and that would be calling what I would be calling the monosynaptic rabies virus then. Is that sort of clear? And, and the cool thing about modifying such viruses is you can actually put any other cargo in that virus. And in this case, this would be, for example, a fluorescent protein like GFP. So by putting that in, you can imagine how powerful this is. You inject it in a muscle and you give the complementation in motor neurons. It jumps one synapse back. The beauty is it just jumps one synapse back. So everything you see in the brain, you can be sure it has a direct connection with these motor neurons. It's not like polysynaptic chains or something like the original virus would have been, but what you see is real direct connections. And, and that is very powerful because you can now begin to use this in a comparative kind of screen and in our case, what we did was to say, well, let's just have a completely fresh look at how, how these pathways are organized, not say, okay, we read in the textbook, you know, the gigantocellular region is supposed to be involved in this, and then we look at this region, but say, okay, we take a totally fresh look at, at, at how are the highways between the brain and the spinal cord organized, and we compare the muscles of the hands with the muscles of the legs, essentially. Now, we don't work in humans, but the idea behind this was that you, you use your hands to make notes, to type on the computer. Any of you would probably have a hard time to do that same thing with your feet. <laughs> so the, the, the specialization of your, of your limbs between, between arms and legs is enormous. And this is actually something that is conserved between um, species and in mice, which is the, the species that we work with, it's also so that the mice actually use their forelimbs for a lot of skilled stuff, for eating, um, grooming, and so on, which they don't do in the same way with the hind limbs. And so we thought that if there are any signals that go from the brain to the spinal cord, we might have a good chance of picking up these regions anatomically by comparing if we do this kind of jumping experiments from the muscles that innervate the um, forelimbs and the hind limbs of a mouse, and then look in the brain, where are these neurons, and do we see differences? And this was the sort of initiation to a lot of work that followed after that, and that is still currently ongoing in my lab. And the idea would be to essentially map all these different pathways between the brain and the, and the, and the motor neurons or the spinal cord. And when we do this, then you can, um, you know, look in the brain and you see not only the cell bodies, but you see neurons. And here are just eight reconstructed neurons from different regions of the brainstem. And you can, you can already see that the, these are very different cell types. They are in different regions of the brainstem that are indicated here that mean nothing to you and didn't mean anything to me when, when we first found them. But the brain, 
is it's a bit like when you take a map for driving somewhere, right? Um, if you go to China, that map means nothing to you. But then once you have lived in China for, for a year and have been driving around on these roads, you will get to know them and they will be part of your map. It's, it's a bit like that with the brain. We started working on the brainstem, these maps and regions that you have essentially a book, which is an atlas. And every, you know, every section of the brain is annotated with names. And, and these days, at the time when we started this, it was not yet, it was not yet available, but what's really cool, I just mentioned this here because it might be actually interesting to you. There is this Allen Brain Reference Atlas in the meantime, where all people are supposed to put their brain sections in that atlas. You can digitalize everything. And the idea is that you can then actually incorporate in that 3D model of the brain everybody else's data. And we have started to use that and, and do that too. And it's really fantastic because you don't become dependent anymore on one particular brain or one experiment you have done, but it's all scaled to the same volume of the brain. And so you can essentially take, in probably 10 years from now, you can take thousands of experiments and say, okay, I want to see the neurons that project here. I want to see this type of neuron and, and, and so on. When we started this, we, we made our own reference brain model and we asked, where are these neurons? Now we can see the rabies expresses the fluorescent protein. It fills the cells and they're really beautiful. I mean, when, when we first had these experiments working, I, I couldn't leave the scope. I was just staring at these neurons for hours and days. It, it's really amazing. I mean, those of you who are not, well, all of you are not experimentalists. I really encourage you wants to go to the lab and, and actually look at the neurons, how they are. It, they are amazing. And, and it, it's, a, it's an experience. It's really an experience. So anyway, um, neurons are many, and, and we reconstructed them in, in a three-dimensional uh, model where we essentially <clears throat> put back... Um, put back in this model... Each dot here is the position of a neuron. Now we take away all the dendrites and axons. We just look at the position. And in pink are the neurons that would communicate with the, with the forelimb. And in cyan, the ones that communicate with the hind limb. Now, this looks very messy at first glance, but probably already in this 3D turning configuration, you could see that there were certain areas in the 3D model that were filled by only one or the other colors. And indeed, when we then went in and we asked um, about which area of the, of the brain are these neurons in, we could see, now you compare the forelimb uh, and the hindlimb reconstruction, and each color here is one of the areas or cities, if you wish, in the brainstem. And you can see that the, the forelimb reconstruction has actually more of these, of these colored clouds. And that means, for example, these red neurons here, which happen to be in an area called MDV, are essentially only talking to the forelimb spinal cord and not to the hindlimb spinal cord. So, so that means you can sort of subdivide the um, brainstem area into um, three categories. One category of regions talks essentially only to the forelimb network. Another category is very interesting to us because it was essentially broadcasting the information throughout the spinal cord, including forelimb and hindlimb. And the third one was more biased towards only hindlimb. And that was really the starting point for, for much of what we did because it's an unbiased anatomical entry point. And we had the hypothesis that regions um, that would talk to specifically the forelimb spinal circuits might also have to do something specifically with the forelimb circuitry, whereas brainstem regions that would broadcast the information throughout the entire length of the spinal cord might have more something to do with full body movements, like when you walk or when you have postural adjustments of your, of your entire body. And, and that would require signals that would be distributed through your entire spinal cord. 
So are there any questions? Yes. Is it possible, for instance, that in VE, Ethereum, yeah. to understand, actually there's two subpopulations, one that uh, goes to HL and the other that goes to FL, but your technique is not able to, to tell them apart? Is that possible? Or? Yes, that is possible. That's possible. Um, because in so in, in the case, well, in the rabies case, it's actually not possible. You can do the experiment, it's just not meaningful. You cannot jump with different colors from the forelimb and the hind limb because some viruses have a, let's say, if one virus infects a neuron, it cannot be infected by a second. And so if you if you have, there's a time window of about six hours where viruses can co-infect. And it's it's when it's outside that window, so longer, then you cannot actually you cannot judge whether they would be co-projecting. But what what is clear is that there are definitely some um, areas where there are neurons that would go only to the hind limb or only to the forelimb, and they would be intermingled. This is is something that you know is is with this methodology a bit difficult to to pick up. What, what is clear, though, from work we have done with other methodologies is that, for example, these middle type of regions, they are mostly not topographically organized in that they will fractionate into ones that would go to cervical and other would go to, to lumbar, but they would be two neurons that project have a very long axons, and they would have many collaterals that would talk to everything along the length of the spinal cord. Um, yes? We already have a hypothesis why, from a functional point of view, a different brain area is involved with the different part of the limbs. Yes, so the, the hypothesis was um, the hypothesis was and is is that you you would want to separate um, the command function for movements in a way that if if you are higher motor centers, let's say in the frontal brain, we want you to take notes. You, you would want to have a specialized command to your right hand to take notes. And, and so for that, at some point, that, that intention needs to be signaled to the spinal cord. And so it wasn't clear where such neurons would reside. And I found it, we found it actually very nice. And I'll show you some evidence that we actually can now enter these neurons and actually show that if we, if we express an optogenetic activator, we can actually get these neurons to induce that behavior. And, and so it's it's very gratifying that you can actually really enter these neurons and, and, and see that they actually are able to instruct that these types of behaviors. Yes. Do you think it's rather one neuron that induces such a kind of behavior or maybe multiple neurons being very closely connected? So in the mouse, uh, it's it's never one neuron. It's a population, it's always a population of neurons, but that would be neurons that are that are not identical, but the same type. And then perhaps subtypes of that gl global type. I mean, I don't know whether you have already talked about neuronal types or types of neurons. You know, there is the extreme view. Well, as I as I was probably wrongly to, to you talking. Uh, some people think a neuron is a neuron, and then the next the next level of, of of sophistication is there is an excitatory and an inhibitory neuron. Then there can be modulatory neurons. Then the other extreme is that some people think every neuron is different. I'm kind of somewhere in between. <laughs> um, there are definitely classes of neurons, and within these classes, you have subpopulations. And then probably at some point, I think in the mammalian nervous system, you you cannot you cannot think that every neuron is a separate subtype. You need to work with populations, and the populations work such that. Have you heard the concept of ensembles, for example? Yes. So um, if you have a, <clears throat> a possible ensemble of thousand neurons that could, in principle, do the same thing. I think in the mammalian nervous system, you could you could say that for, to do a behavior, you would need to recruit any hundred of these possible thousand. 
an any any hundred could more or less produce that behavior, but it doesn't matter exactly which exact hundred. Okay, and then if you do it the second time, it will be again a hundred, but there might be an overlap of fifty, but there will be fifty other ones of the pool thousand. Now, if you go to species that are uh, with a more smaller nervous system, like C. elegans or Drosophila, there will be fewer neurons in that ensemble. There might be cases where you have a single neuron that is the command to do that. So, for example, to do the thing of the Drosophila wing, people have identified groups of pairs of two neurons each. Now, in the mouse, I, I don't think there will be any case like that where there is a single neuron solely responsible for something. I think the, high, the more elaborate nervous systems you go, humans are extreme example, you will have populations. And, and when you work with populations, there will be probabilities how and what the neuron is recruited. And I, you know, one question is often, is this noise or is it intention that you always recruit a hundred out of a thousand? So this is something that I think you, you guys might also have discussed, the concept of noise and, and reproducibility and reliability of neuronal encoding. Now, I think what we have learned in the motor system is that the closer to the motor output you go, the higher the reliability of recruitment of a neuron in a behavior is. That means I, I will show you examples of where when we are when we're in the brainstem, which is very close to output, there is a high reliability. So if you recall from a neuron, all, almost every time an animal is doing a behavior where that neuron is recruited, that neuron is firing. And, and so that is something which is actually very nice when you're relatively close to the output. When you're in, on the other hand, probably in a, in a cortical area that is many synapses away from the actual movement that is influenced by a lot of other stuff like the states, the hunger, and so on, then the reliability would drop to a, to a, to a lower level and perhaps the reliability would be 10%. But overall, you would still have of the ensemble of, of, of thousand possible neurons, a hundred, but it would be more difficult to, to grasp what's, what's going on. So I think what, what I'll do now is um, show you some examples of, um, you know, I, I, I have prepared essentially three parts and we can, we can go back and forth and discuss about different things I'd like to see. I'd just like to show you two examples of what we've done on brainstem neurons that, that regulate these two different types of behaviors. One is this population that is the more full body type of movement behavior. And the other one is the forelimb specific movement. And indeed, sort of what we have seen from the anatomy, um, we have now evidence on the functional level that this is indeed like that. That these neurons that are anatomically showing these connectivity schemes are actually really used for, for these different behaviors and are task dependent. And and so the first set of data I'll show you is the is this region called magnocellular region. That is a region that, um, as you will see, is is uh, required for um, locomotion or walking. Did you have a question? No. Uh, yes. Yeah. But is there then a, like a feedback signal to the directly from the motor neurons, <laughs> and is it like specific as the feed for the signal, or is widespread among the brain areas? So a signal directly from the motor neuron, there is not. So the, the motor neuron, um, let me go back to this scheme. So the motor neuron essentially is, is a pure efferent root. So the motor neuron sits in the ventral horn of the spinal cord, has dendrites, and on the dendrites are the synapses of all these inputs that can be the local networks of the CPG central pattern generator and the, and the descending inputs. But the axon output with very few exceptions, there is the Renshaw cell that gets a collateral of the axon, but the, uh, the axon of the motor neuron doesn't do anything feedback type. It goes just to the muscle. 
But in the muscle, and I don't have any slides on this here today, but I'll, I'll tell you anyway. In the muscle, you have you have sensors that are called muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs that essentially measure the state of contraction of your muscle and bring this signal back into the spinal cord. And the, the most you know, well-known and well-studied circuit of our sensory feedback is actually the monosynaptic reflex circuit, which is this knee-jerk reflex. You can do it on your, on your colleague. You sit on the chair, right? Thing goes up. That's uh, due to a monosynaptic reflex circuit that only includes the motor neuron projecting to the muscle and the sensory neuron having one axon that goes to the muscle and one axon that goes back in to the motor neuron. That's, and, and if that thing does not work, it means there is a, a problem in any, any of these components. There can be a problem with conduction velocity from the motor neuron or the sensory neuron. There can be a degeneration of one of these neurons. Um, that's not good news if, if the knee jerk reflex doesn't work anymore. Then, of course, these signals also need to go to the brain to inform the brain. There is pathways that go from the spinal cord to the brain, brainstem, and then to the thalamus, to the cortex, there's loops. These, these are even less understood than the descending pathways, but it's very clear that essentially at every moment when you when you move, you can you can view this as a as a as a you know a time series constantly going on. First of all, you are looking into the future of what you're planning to do. And your nervous system has a prediction of what's going to happen next. And then so this is sort of the efference copy signals goes away from every motor pathway, essentially signaling back to the sensory feedback system. I'm expecting that in one second, this is going to happen. If there is no deviation from this plan, then nothing happens, you keep walking. If on the other hand, all of a sudden something unexpected happens, like you stumble over something that you haven't actually seen, you need to do a correction. And, and that is that is because obviously something is not as predicted. And that comes from then actual sensory feedback. Because when you stumble over something, the immediate reaction of the sensory system and the sensory system in comparison with, with what was planned says, well, you were wrong. It, it didn't happen what, what you predicted. And I need to do an adjustment. Then there's an immediate reaction to the motor output system to adjust that. And then you can react very quickly. These are relatively complex circuits, but they need to be fast, obviously, otherwise you fall. And, and that's uh, something that many people study. It's very complex because these, these signals that come from the motor system to the sensory system, so these efference pathways, they happen essentially at every level of the motor output system. And so it's experimentally very difficult to say, okay, we block efference copy signaling because it would essentially mean you have to do it throughout the entire nervous system. So the fit that now is not local, is like the upper part of the body and the lower part, feedback signal is all together, it's not separated. No, no, it is highly separated. And that's the, of course, you need to know where your deviation was, right? When you when you stumble with your legs, you want to do the control movement with your legs and not with your arms. I mean, unless you need to really horse, <laughs> you really fall on the floor, then you need to in involve your arms. But essentially, all body signals are um, topographic according to your body parts. There is, for those of you who are interested in that, there is a condition that is very rare. With, where viruses attack proprioceptors, which are the sensory, sensory uh, is the sensory system for where in space is your body. So obviously, when you close your eyes, you actually have an awareness of where your body parts are. You will know where your hand is and where your foot is. These people can no longer sense where where the, where the body parts are. And and uh, there is a BBC movie on, and there is also a book writ written by Oliver Sacks on on this uh, on these patients. It's very impressive because some of them actually relearn to move 
because obviously the motor output system is not defective. It's 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 the way they deal with sensation that is defective. And they can actually relearn to move by using the visual system. So it's much more energy consuming for the nervous system because everything needs to be visually guided and planned and, and not through some other sensation, which is something we don't think about. Some people, most people actually don't even, if I, if I had asked you what are the sensory systems that you are aware of, what, what would have been your answer? What kind of sensory systems do we, do we have? Everyone can say one. <laughs> Vision, hearing. Yes. Touch, yeah. Smelling, smelling. Taste. Taste, yeah. Hearing. What? Hearing. Hearing. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so the touch is kind of part of, of this is a somato sensation. But in the muscles are these sensors that are part of the somatosensory system. That is really what, what informs your brain of, of where in space is your body. That's, that's, that's actually key for movement. And for those interested in this, this is like a one hour movie. Um, I can send you the link, Rava, and you can distribute it. It's quite impressive. The question about this is that you also get the external copy, so you know. You, so you have incomplete information without yes. a proprioception, but you still have some information from uh, the efferent copy. Yes, but the, the evidence copy just signals what is planned and not, not the actual what that happened. And it, it, the nervous system always needs to compare what you plan with what is happening or has happened. And if you don't get the stream of what is happening or what has happened, then it's very difficult to make any use of the inference copy. So that that guy actually comments that yes, he learns in he learns again how to move, and you actually can see how he walks and all that. But the moment the light goes off, he is essentially like banana. He 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 cannot because he just doesn't cannot he cannot predict what he's going. Well, he cannot actually. Move even though his muscles and the output system is completely normal. Are all these senses are arranged in a topographic manner on the cortex. Yeah, so not only on the cortex, uh, already in the ascending pathways that there is the first processing center in the brainstem, and then it goes to the thalamus. Some of them go actually directly to the thalamus, and the thalamus is highly organized in terms of what regions of the thalamus these these signals go to and then the next level is then the cortex that's that's highly organized it's it's highly organized it's conserved uh, with development so babies also have similar yes this is made made uh, through development i'm not so sure how in how far the this this type of body feedback circuits have been studied exactly whether they're from the beginning precise or whether they they need usage to be pruned. Some of these salamic circuits are actually very much input, very much subject to to usage. Yeah. Yes. I know people with like a very advanced syphilis, ter tertiary syphilis will sometimes smack their feet on the floor because they mm -hmm. can't smell with it. So that they get an auditory feedback. Yes. That their foot is on the floor and they can move. Is this a problem with tactile feedback or? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. So the, these are these are which kind of people? The people that that. For sure, syphilis. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't know. I really don't know. No, I don't know. And you know, even that patient that I described now with the supposed proprioceptive feedback, this is all you patients, you can't actually go in and take a sample or just have a look at the neurons because they are alive. And and so this is based on sort of conduction velocity measurements because the proprioceptors are the biggest cells of the sensory of the DRG. And so they have the fastest conduction velocities. So you can sort of do conduction velocity measurements of the nerves 
and, and they found that the slow conducting nerves are still working, which are more sort of the pain and the cutaneous fibers, but the, the really fast conducting ones were gone. And so from that, they concluded very likely the, the proprioceptors are defective, I, whether the cells are still there or whether just the, the, the axons are degenerated. They don't know that because they can't actually go in and take out that DRG, obviously. <laughs> Uh, it's it's a bit difficult with with these human type of experiments, but um, <clears throat> I didn't I didn't put that in the talk. But we have also worked on proprioception, and there are mice that have mutations in the proprioceptive system and in different subpopulations of proprioceptive systems. So you can actually you can actually study mice that have defective de defects in in that, and 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 that that's a, that's a. a a good entry level to see actually what proprioception is good for and what kind of defects they have if they if they don't have proprioception anymore. Okay, so um, I want to tell you a little bit about locomotion. Locomotion is essentially is essential for all of us. It's what makes us move from here to lunch. The Münster or wherever you go this afternoon. Uh, on your legs, um, animals with four legs walk on all four legs. Historically, centers in the brain that are involved in locomotion have been studied the cat a lot. And what people have done is to use electrical stimulation in the cat brain, uh, essentially to ask whether they can locate regions in the brain that um, when stimulated, elicit locomotion. And they have found such regions. And one region that they have found and still actually studied a lot these days is this so-called mesencephalic locomotor region. So when you when you start when you stimulate this MLR or mesencephalic locomotor region, the cat starts walking. Essentially, it starts walking. And um, in regions in the kind of brainstem region, which is caudal to this midbrain, where we have found most of the neurons that talk to the spinal cord located, people were actually not able to find um, neurons that would induce locomotion reliably. But that was surprising because it had been proposed that these midbrain centers, they would communicate through these medulla regions, and then the medulla region would be the one who gives the commands to locomote. So it was kind of surprising why it wasn't, we were not, a, one was not able to induce locomotion from these medulla regions. And it had been proposed that this could be because there is actually cell diversity. So imagine you you are stimulating at the same time an engine and, and put, put the brakes on, nothing is going to happen. And that's more or less exactly why people were not able to stimulate that caudal region and get locomotion. In our studies, we found that there is a small region, which in the atlas is called LPGI, or lateral paragigantocellular region. If in that region we stimulate, now not using electrical stimulation, but optogenetics, we can actually get locomotion. But we can only get locomotion when we go in cell type specific manner into this region. So this is just to show you if you have never seen this, but this is how, for example, one section of the brain or brainstem in this case looks like if you go in, in this book. And, and so you can see it's like countries. It's, these are the regions. Don't ask me. I still don't know how, how these boundaries have been defined for the most part. But what we did is essentially kind of assume these boundaries are what they are. And we went in and tried to stimulate in this, in this region that we had seen anatomically to be broadcasting signals and separately, according to the names, stimulate optogenetically. Do, do you guys know what optogenetics is? Yes. So essentially, you bring in a, a, you know, a channel that is light sensitive and that when you, when you put the blue light on, the, the neuron that expresses it will start fire action potentials. And when we did this in all the neurons together of any of these four regions that are marked here by color, we actually didn't see locomotion. 
And that was totally in line with what people had seen in CAT. But we realized that in each of these regions, actually excitatory and inhibitory neurons were both present and they were intermingled. And so in this case, um, we have markers for the excitatory and inhibitory neurons, which um, in, in the brainstem, the vesicular glutamate transporter 2 or VGLU2 is expressed in the glutamatergic neurons and VGAT is a general marker for all inhibitory neurons all throughout the brain. It's the vesicular transporter uh, for the inhibitory neurotransmitters. And these neurons would be intermingled in each of these regions but we can access them because we have mouse lines that express three recombinase and we can use viruses that express then the channel rhodopsin only in these neurons. So we have mice that express the channel rhodopsin only in the inhibitory or excitatory neurons and we can stimulate them and see what kind of behavior is elicited. And not like when we stimulate all neurons, but when we stimulate the excitatory neurons, we were able to induce locomotion. And I'll show you the movie here. You can see this is a mouse in an open field. It, this cable is where we bring in the light. You can see the blue light um, coming on whenever there's this on signal. And we stimulate whenever there is, um, when, whenever the mouse is stationary. And you can see that it starts locomoting every time. I really like it starts locomoting. And that is something we would not see in any of these other regions when we stimulate a similar number of neurons in the neighboring regions, there is no locomotion. This is highly restricted to a small region of the brainstem. And <clears throat> the reason why we are not able to stimulate locomotion when we stimulate all neurons is the intermingled inhibitory neurons. Because what we found when we, when we stimulate the inhibitory neurons um, that are intermingled is that this actually leads to the opposite phenotype, namely stopping. And so what you can see here is that now we express the optogenetic activator in the VGAT neurons, similar number of neurons in the same region. And depending on in which subregion we are, we induce a different behavioral, stall, behavioral stalling. In the LPGI, you can see that the mouse is, when now the mouse is locomoting, whenever, we, whenever it's locomoting, we start the laser, and you can see that the mouse stops. Now, this mouse here, um, what can you see? It also stops, but it does it very differently. What's happening? <laughs> Usually people are very stunned when they see this. <laughs> Somebody can say what's, what we can see. Can you control the speed of the locomotion with the stimulation? Yes. So the, this is actually, this was the, the classical finding of the MLR was that the higher the electrical stimulation, the higher the speed. And we could, re, we can reproduce that with optogenetics. So if you give, if you give more light, stronger light, more, more power, the mouse runs like crazy. So you can control the speed. Um, so, you know, it begins to become a bit spooky because obviously none of these mice probably want to do that. Um, but because we have the control elements, we can make them do that. We can, we can control them. Can I say one, how to think about this? Because so what you're saying is that if you um, excite subsets of neurons, then you elicit some stereotypical behavior. Yes. Often we hear that motor repertoire is kind of a set of stereotypical. On, on the other hand, we can do many that are not in these repertoires, mm -hmm. probably the mouse or so. So how should we think about this? Uh, yes, so I think this is a very, this is a very stereotypic type of behavior because when you walk, yes, you, you, you don't walk always exactly in the same way, but the principle of how you walk is the same. I'm not assuming you hop with both legs. I'm, I'm assuming when you, when you walk, you alternate your, your legs, right? 
<laughs> and, and that is the stereotype this typic part about it then the exact manifestation might be might be a bit different and mm -hmm. yes you will probably have a you will have a component of oh i should turn a bit to the left or to the right and this stuff but that is done by another by another signal but perhaps your question will be will be more interesting to address in the context of the skilled movements because there you know the, the repertoire is essentially enormous and i i don't I don't really know yet. I have some some theories of how it might work. Yes. So uh, some animals have different types of locomotion. They go walking. Yes. Around, but to increase the intensity. Yeah. They will move. So when you stimulate the MLR and they go a certain, above a certain speed, they will start hopping. Because, I mean, if any of you go out and, and watch some sheep, or cows or dogs running, initially they have the, the alternating gait. And when they go really high speed, they go, the front legs and the hind legs are in synchrony and that makes them go faster. Happen the same here. Would happen the same. Would happen the same. Yeah. Uh, how that is done, I don't know. Nobody actually knows how, how the gait switch occurs. There's some theories that this might actually happen at the level of the spine cord, um, but nobody really knows. Yes. Oh, sorry. The desterebrate cat preparations. Yeah. Um, back in the number one. Mm -hmm. Those. Do you remember those cats switched gates? They switch gates. Yeah. So, so the the ones that I the one that I showed there this. This MLR stimulation, this this thing works essentially also in decerebrate. So you can decerebrate and you can stimulate the MLR, and 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 the cat will will do the gate switch. It's definitely something that doesn't involve cortex or any forebrain circuits. Hmm. Yes. Uh, have we studied the projections from MLR to LPG? Yes. Yes. Um, are there also projections to the inhibitory neurons? And they're kind of coming from someone else, or they're just local? So what we have done is we have essentially, we have stimulated. So if you stimulate the axons from the MLR over the LPGI, then we can induce locomotion. From, from that we have, we have, we kind of think, and actually, okay, so that we can induce locomotion. If we block, the LPGI excitatory neurons at the same time, that doesn't work. So it means that the signal from the MLR goes through the LPGI neurons in the medulla and not directly to the spine. So the MLR um, in, in a study we've published last year has a small population of neurons that project directly to the spinal cord, but that is not involved in locomotion, that is involved in body extension. So if you, well, essentially if a mouse rears, if it gets up, so it shortens or lengthens the body. That's a direct signal to the spinal cord, but the locomotion that involves limb movements that goes through the medulla. I think oh yeah, sorry. So you mentioned this brain region that you studied uh, where you cause the movement with your, your excite, uh, Excitatory neurons. Is this known that then what is the role of inhibitory neurons? Do they activate slightly after? Or, and I have a second question. Is this um, excitatory neurons, is this one cell type, or are there even more cell types mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. cause movement? So, inhibitory neurons, you have essentially done nothing except that, that kind of optogenetic activation type of experiments, but it's a super interesting question. We're beginning to do stuff now because in the brainstem, about half of the neurons are these inhibitory neurons, and they are very different from the cortical neurons, from the cortical inhibitory neurons. They are not these kind of local pavalbumin type of interneurons, but they're also projection neurons. So they cannot be forgotten. They Some of them even project to the spinal cord, but for sure within the brainstem, they're not only local interneurons. Um, and so we don't know. We have we have done recordings, but not in a in a cell type specific manner. 
with respect to the question of subtypes, I, I think that we will find that there are subtypes within. I, I will, in the in the thing I show you now about four limb, uh, we can, I can show you that we have at least four populations identified of the excitatory type. For the locomotion, we haven't done any of this yet. We, I have a postdoc who currently actually does molecular profiling on these identified, behaviorally identified neurons, and she finds beautiful molecular subtypes. Now, then we can go back into the animal and ask whether, you know, within the big, big class, if we have 10 molecular subtypes, can we refine our functional models based on these subtypes that we see molecularly? So, yes, yeah, so sorry, this we were stuck here with this. So this is this is I find it very interesting because this is, as I said, it's one of the very few things we've done with inhibitory neurons. It's a similar number of neurons that we stimulate. One both leads to a stop that if you would just classify whether the mouse moves or not, they would say stop. But the way they stop is very different. In in the left hand case, it's a it's a essentially natural stop. You still keep all your muscle tone and you're you're fine. On the right side, the mouse completely collapses. And this is very likely the region that you guys activate when you sleep and when you are in the phase when you're dreaming and when you're moving in your dreams, but you don't want to move. <laughs> because if you, some people have, this is actually also a disease uh, where people start moving, not, not to sleep, uh, not, not walking around, but actually when you move. This is the population that is probably activated so that you essentially remain still, even though you dream of a lot of stuff. Yes. Is the level of coordination of this kind of induced movements comparable to one of the intentional movements in the same situation? I mean, the, which, which situation? Uh, for example, if the, top, if the mouse has to stop, uh, but not because he, we are, you're uh, inducing this behavior. Yes. Is the level of movement coordination comparable in the two cases? So you mean whether if we were to um, record a normal, a, a natural stop? Yeah. So this, I find it very surprising. It is very similar. And, and the same goes for the locomotion. If we track the kinematics of the optogenetically induced locomotion, it's very similar to when we track the kinematics of a normally locomoting mouse. And, and I find this kind of surprising as I, I show for the for, work on the forelimb, when, where we have a lot of recording data, not all neurons are active exactly in the same way, though when you go in with an optogenetic activator, you will kind of enforce them all to fire at the same time. The behavior is very similar to a natural behavior, uh, even though you probably have a very different pattern of how these neurons are activated, because with the optogenetic stimulator, you will, you will lose the diversity of, of, of cell activities in the population. And, and so I find that quite surprising that even though you go in with something relatively artificial, the output of the behavior is actually looks relatively natural. It's, it's a good question. And it's, it's one that I was actually puzzled about also. And I, I'm, I'm still surprised that uh, as to how natural these behaviors are. Yes, so this was what, what I briefly responded before. The MLR signal that induces the locomotion goes through the medulla. And I, I, I was mentioning the experiments we did to show that. And then it's the medulla that signals the locomotion signal to the spinal cord. The one that goes directly from MLR to the spinal cord is, is one that um, is actually active, uh, activating rearing or body extension. And in, in the MLR, we have, we have actually done recordings from these neurons. In the MLR, there are um, at least three different subtypes of neurons. Um, and one of them um, we work on right now a lot is, is one that was actually previously not known, but that actually signals back to the basal ganglia and has a completely different role from the locomotion role. And, and that is something that has 
essentially messed up a, a clinical approach because people have actually tried to use DBS, so deep brain stimulation in Parkinson patients in the MLR. Do, do you know how what people use DBS for? So it's essentially a way to try to, you know, reinstate function by, by stimulating going into the human brain. In Parkinson, the, the most uh, used region is the subthalamic nucleus. When, when all the, the drugs fail, then the next, the last sort of uh, possibility is to stimulate there. I don't have the movie here, but it's super impressed. Patients switch on the DBS. You see nothing. <laughs> they, are, they are like normal. And you switch it off and they essentially can't move. They have a lot of tremor. But this MLR region has been experimentally tried also as a DPS target for Parkinson's because some of the things are not, not uh, taken care of with STN stimulation. But th these results were really not convincing. And I think it's because of cell type diversity because we found that this population that actually projects back to the basal ganglia, if you optogenetically activate, induces behavioral stalling because this is an excitatory population that signals excitation to the inhibitory output of the basal ganglia. And so essentially it blocks all motor output at the same time if you stimulate them all at the same time. Now, depending on wherever this DBS electrode was implanted, because these neurons are all intermingled, it will be a messy situation. And, and so I think for many regions where one would want to have hopes to use DBS or anything like stimulation of of neurons or inhibition of neurons, one would really need to have cell type specific approaches. Uh, now, how that can be done in humans is then a, another question, but I don't know. I think probably the use of, you know, humanized AV promoter type um, things, either together with optogenetics and local implantation, or some other tools that are non-invasive that might come up in the future could be approaches. But I think for many regions of the brain, this kind of non-cell type specific stimulation is 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 kind of at at the at its at its end <laughs> point. For, so you know there are some regions like STN where where it's it's okay because the, the cell types are relatively uniform and almost the dominant phenotype is overriding what what could be a problem. But for many regions, there might actually be possibilities to do DBS type approaches um, in a in a in a in a better way. See, here, when you see in the mouse, when you say type, you mean where they project, or you mean genetic? Yes. So here, I actually mean where they project, and and this has been a, a very very fruitful approach for us in in many regions, and also for the forelimb regions that I show you we have actually seen that when you ask where is a region sending its axons to, and then you go to the targets and you ask, are these actually the same neurons that collateralize to more than one target or are they different types, they are different projection neurons? Often it's different projection neurons. And that gives you a way to actually target these neurons without having to have molecular markers. But there could be several types. There could be several types. So, for example, here we were very lucky because we found a mouse line that would actually, just by chance, express in this neuron population that projects to the substantia nigra. Um, but for many, we actually don't have molecular markers or Cree lines, but we can target them. Now, as you were saying, within this spinal cord projecting population or medulla projecting population, when we go in, it might be that there will be five additional subtypes. We don't know that. That, but based on projection there, we couldn't, we couldn't distinguish them. Question. Yep. This may be become a little philosophical, but how, how densely interconnected are, do you think, these different cells of this different cell types are? How much are they talking to each other? Yeah, so this is actually something we have no clue <laughs> because this is something that I think you could only look at in a slice and we haven't done any slice work. Um, so I don't know. I don't actually know whether, whether the, the purple and the blue neurons are connected. There are also in this region, there are inhibitory neurons and I don't know whether they are local or long distance. We haven't even done any on this. 
we have uh, we have up to now essentially only looked at not long range but at least outside the region type of projection types and not done any work on it's it's highly relevant i'm aware it's like this question on the inhibitory neurons we have just focused on the excit excitatory network up to now because behaviorally optogenetically most of the phenotypes that we were um, interested in terms of positive movement generating stuff we saw in excitatory neurons the inhibitory neurons usually gave stopping and so even though i must say stopping is at least equally important as <laughs> initiation but but uh, yeah because we don't have endless you know people resources and so on we we, we concentrated so far on the dietary network with projections that go outside the region but it's a it's a totally valid comment let me ask the philosophical question we need to start it by pointing out that a lot of computational thinking tends to group mm -hmm. together and, but of course there is a lot of computational work that is thinking about different areas or different nuclei. Yes. And at what point uh, do we distinguish between different populations within one thing that looks like an anatomical area and different areas, right? I mean, there seems different species, I mean, I guess the classic example is orientation tuning. Yes. Uh, whether it's columnar structured or all integer data that are different um, we don't really understand why, I think, if we see one pattern in one set of species and another, another. Where does the line between cell type and, and an area begin? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Well, you know, what is becoming clear is that within an area that we will call an area, which will be in this case the MLR, there are cell types. And what, what is in this case still missing is the interconnectivity. But in the cortex, um, I think there, you know, with, with all this stuff that on the motor cortex that came out last year, there was a whole issue on, on nature, on the cell types, and also physiology there in slice and so on. One really begins to understand not only the long range, but also the local connectome much better. And, and there, one would probably say that's one area or not. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, there's definitely different projection patterns, right? There's yes. extreme being the PT and IT. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then even, you know, with the, within the PT, I, I mean, I have some slides on this, but I, I, I think we will not get to it. But within the PT, there's so much diversity. It's crazy. Um, and and um, I think one extremely powerful approach is this single neuron reconstruction uh, databases which gives you also for the output of, of single neurons, gives you precision. Because when you just, like we do now, do population, you see that the entire population as a population projects, let's say, to five, to five places, even if you have it already as a projection stratified. But that doesn't mean that every single neuron has collaterals to all these five places. It could be that you tagging into the one that projects to region A, but then there will be five different populations with respect to how they go to B, C, D, E. Or it could be that each single neuron has all five collaterals. And that's of a very different type of uh, model then that you would need to work with, right? And for the, for the motor cortex or for the cortical neurons, it, it begins to, it begins to emerge that it's not such that all that, that that the signal all gets broadcasted to all 20 targets of the cortex, but that there is really subtypes. And I, I believe that the, the targets are very important. I, so I think, you know, for example, if you if you look at the IT neurons that go to the straight, they have a huge arborization in the straight. The PT neurons generally have a much smaller arborization. Now, of course, you then also need to know whether Arborization doesn't mean function. It could, there can be can be bismal contacts and very weak contacts, or it can be super strong impact and impactful in, uh, inputs. That all needs to be taken into consideration. But 
things begin to become possible to actually include that probably. I don't know. I would be interested to hear your thoughts on, you know, how, how you use this new type of information for your modeling or computation work. It's, it's very challenging, I know. <laughs> but I think it's, it, it's the right time that experimentalists really, you know, engage with, with computational people to, to begin at least, think about how one can incorporate this type of findings into, into models. Yes. Just for the discussion, do you think in the future uh, there will be an emphasis on estimating the connection probabilities? Because from the perspective of computational neuroscience, mm -hmm. it's very important when you have to build a model to estimate the connection probabilities. Yes. And uh, by personal experience, it can be sometimes very difficult to find in, uh, yeah. in biological papers the exact probabilities between two specific yeah. populations. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that stuff that will have to come and that uh, the people are beginning to become aware of. Uh, then probability of connection, again, there is this thing of anatomical connection versus actual functional connection, then there is the reliability of, of, of a neuron, um, meaning how many times does it do it? That's highly relevant for, for, for your models. I don't know where I have this. Um, maybe I can go quickly to this. Um, yeah, so this is essentially the, the bottom part here of, of general principles is that <clears throat> when you when you look at you know what, what we would say these ensembles, that if you have a, an ensemble of neurons that in principle would be would be active during action A, an other ensemble in blue that would be active during action B, and a third ensemble that would be act, active during action A and B, each of the neurons would have a recruitment reliability that could be anywhere between zero and 100%. Now, if you have a very, very, very reliable neuron that is always and only action-specific A, that, that is very important for your model to know. And if you know, okay, of 100 neurons, I have two such neurons that are always active, reliably, and only in action A and not in action B and C and D. That those are key, this is key information. And there might be something what people refer to hub neurons that are highly specialized and highly tuned and highly, you know, the visual system work from um, Tom Mercy Flogel and colleagues has also shown that there are such neurons that are the highly connected and highly, you know, but there are very few of those. And then you have the whole CE of which is which is the kind of neurons that are less highly recruitable and less highly tuned action A only. And, and this is stuff that I, I understand it must be extremely difficult to incorporate it into modeling work because it's it's very vague type of information. Yeah. Not these sub neurons are anatomically distinct from or like the more like just looking at them can we see different in the reliability or is it not open? yeah that uh that i don't know i don't know this the, i think that that the, we work on the reliability is, is and recruit yeah recruitment reliability it's probably something that in the cortex which is, is probably most advanced in our case at the at the caudal brainstem level the reliability is actually mostly very high i i, I mean We'll, we'll get to this, but it's just to show you sample-wise, this will be recording in one of these four limb regions now, where we record uh, during different tasks. So the mouse is essentially doing different four limb tasks. One is a reaching task, reaching for a food pellet or reaching for a lever and pressing it. And then when it has the food, it handles the food. And then there are neurons that are what we call reaching tuned, they would be essentially active in the reaching phase of both the pellet or the lever task, but they would be completely silent in food handling. And and um, and then there would be another population that would be essentially silent in the reaching, but they would be super active during handling. It's totally different neurons. And what you can see here is that this is essentially active in every trial. So they would be having a 100% reliability over there. 90%, very highly reliable. Um, in, in, the, in the caudal brainstem, most neurons that we record from are relatively highly reliable. 
but and and that actually could be possibly for modeling work actually kind of interesting. <laughs> I I I don't know, but uh, what we are missing on the other hand in the cold brainstem is what what you were saying before the interconnectivity. We, we don't have much on that at this point. Normally we would end around twelve. Yes. I don't know if I mean it's a bit frustrating because I see you. There's much more you. Could yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think one. I can, I can, I can. Let's say wrap up in in five to ten minutes. I could just. Uh, I, I wanted to say for the for the four limb um, part because I wanted to show you this because it's really it's really amazing and and this will stay in your memory hopefully. <laughs> Before you do that and you wrap up, I wanted to see if there are any questions from Beijing. So you can also, uh, for, for students in Beijing, you can also put questions in the chat. Ah, okay. Um, oh, okay. Hearing also could be used to the body columns. How do you separate the brain waves? You have to repeat it now. How do you separate the brain regions? How do you separate the brain regions? Yes, that is just just what? Peering. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, well, I um yeah, the brain regions that are related to fearing one one kind of knows quite well. <laughs> and and this region where we are in is 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 too far too far too close to motor outputs to relate to fearing. It's 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 very likely on the pathway out of the fear. Um, we have actually published a paper with, with Andreas Lüthi's lab a few years ago that shows that there is also a connectivity between the PAG, which is a, a center in the midbrain, and, and some of these um, medulla circuits. These are kind of output neurons that definitely... So, I don't think that the neurons I showed you today are related to fearing because the mouse is actually naturally stopping and not freezing. So fearing usually induces a freezing, which essentially is like the mouse, like the name says, completely frozen. So if I may, just show you some work on the four limb actions. Four limb actions are very different from, from walking around because they involve your hand and the digits and they involve you know, that I'm gonna properly reach to this so that I can take it. So they have phases of reaching, grasping, retrieval, and when I have it, move it. And- so Sorry, there's another question. <laughs> VL gut and V gut neurons have different projections in medulla. I think that was the question. Yeah. Um, so they both project to the spinal cord, and uh, we haven't actually. Well, we have we have looked at that a little bit. So the V gut neurons seem to go um, quite strongly directly on motor neurons, which um, would explain why the mouse, uh, you know, stops. Uh, the v glute neurons they go more to interneurons in the spinal cord and and therefore would probably interact with central pattern generator networks. Good. Okay. So anyway, for the four limb, we actually identified that there are four different population based on where they project. One projects to the spinal cord, um, one projects to the other side of the brain, and two projects to the caudal region of the medulla. And we have found that they actually have different roles in falling behavior. So depending on where they project, they have different roles. And we, we found that the one that projects to the spinal cord is active during reaching. I just showed you before the so that these, these neurons that are the reaching neurons are the ones that project to the spinal cord. And there are others that are active when the mouse is handling. And these are the neurons that would have a step in the caudal brain step. Now, from this work, what I think was then really cool is to make a prediction that if we would 
optogenetically activate these neurons based on where they project, then can we actually install, can we make the mouse do these behaviors? So similar to what we did before, now instead of going into the locomotion region, we go in this forelimb region and we stimulate the neurons based on where they project to. And we can see that depending on where they project to, we elicit very different behaviors. On the left side, you see when we stimulate the neurons that project to the spinal cord, we induce a reaching on unilateral, only one side. When we stimulate neurons that project to the MDV, we project a hand to mouse movement and you can, you can see that mouse, even though it doesn't have anything to eat, it looks like it's, it's using its hand to want to eat. The grooming, reach to graph, which means reach, but it uses the digits or tapping. And it depends on in which neuronal population you are based on the projection you can make the mouse do these behaviors. It's a similar type of number of neurons as, as we have seen before that induces locomotion just in a different region. And so by essentially understanding the subpopulations based on, in our case, relatively trivial still, based on neurotransmitter, gene expression, and or where they project to, we can actually stratify them um, according to their behavioral function um, and I think many of these things will be will be much more um, pronounced in the future as we as we learn more about subtypes. Yes. Yeah, it's an amazing result. Uh, what will happen if you sim uh, stimulate at the same time? Yes. Those two areas. Yes. Like so, between two behaviors, or one will be selected, or will be a mess. My my guess would be that one would be dominant. Um, with these opt on the intensity of the of the stimulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know, uh, but we cannot do it. I think we would need to have the optogenetic activators are not so clean in the sense that you can use two different colors um, that would be cleanly separable by two different light uh, you know, wavelengths. Um, but I I think what what I what I think from my our experience from optogenetics is that with optogenetics, there's usually one dominant thing that overrides everything. And, and so, in fact, you know, how, how, how um, the, these results are, would be very different if we go in just like that in the region with VGLU2. Any random subset would would give a forelimb type behavior, but nothing as clean as this. It would be kind of a something like that. So it means that you can actually get meaning, meaningless type of behaviors if you're not in the right subset of neurons. Now, by, by this projection stratific stratification, we can get to a level where we can get into a meaningful subset, but we might be still at the position where we're not in the right uh, whatever 10 neurons that is needed to do that. And that goes back to your question. If we could target, you know, if we could do what people can do in the cortex, which are these type of read and write experiment, you essentially read the activity of the neurons using GCAMP. And then you say, now I'm going to do an optogenetic stimulation experiment. I'm going to write back that same activity and see what happens. Or I'm going to alternatively write another activity and see what happens. We are not at the level where we can do that in the brainstem, where we say we infect 100 neurons and we want this neuron to be stimulated like this and this and this. Because then we could test if we give a, a pattern stimulation on these 100 neurons with this, what exactly is the kinematic output? If we do that, what is the output? Right. Um, can we actually get, let's say, a reaching behavior? It's not like a reaching behavior. It could be like that. It could be like that. Can we actually program these vari variations of the behavior by the code that we give into these neurons? So, Deb, you were at the same time, so I don't know. I guess it's a related question. If you were to stimulate the target neurons from these, or the target areas, mm -hmm. you get similar organized behaviors, or is it something specific about the pattern of activation coming from the presynaptic input that matters? Yes, so it's stuff we're doing right now. I think that the targets, again, we would have to need some stratification, right? 
So what we could do, of course, is we could, there are some tools that jump into the neuron postsynaptically and then stimulate that. Um, if we just go in the target area and stimulate all target neurons, it would be messy. Um, so if you stimulate, on the other hand, the axons over that target area, we get the same thing because that's essentially like stimulating cell bodies. Yes. So you demonstrate the, demonstrate the mapping between subtle neurons and distinct environments. Mm -hmm. So my question, thinking about humans, how many distinct movements do we have that have been subtitulation? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. It goes back a bit to what Rava was asking before, and how how can we how can we use this to go in and in a meaningful way help correct things that don't work anymore, right? Because you also don't want to just if you go in, into a locomotion center, you don't want that person to just run four hundred meter. You want you want to be able that person should still be able to react what i found surprising is is that when we do these optogenetic stimulation experiments like the locomotion you would think we are actually very close to motor output but these mice are still able to react they they don't run into the wall you think they would just if you gave them the drive they will just run straight and into the wall but they are able to see there is a wall and turn so so even though we are so close to the output they still have the ability to have parallel pathways that work and actually make them turn when they when they are against the wall, which I find it very surprising because these are very powerful optogenetic type of experiments. And initially, we were worried that you know that they would just run into a wall. So related to that, how the wall future with more fine experiments, you think you'll find more sub movements and more sub populations or no, no, no. I think I think we're we're only just at the tip of the iceberg, but uh, I I have a bit of a hard time to to exactly decide in which direction we should go. So if any of you have some suggestions, <laughs> I think there's there's many possibilities. I think the local connectivity and functionality of the local thing is very interesting. I also think that to incorporate the inhibitory projection neurons is very interesting. I think we need to learn more about the excitatory neurons and their dynamics. We have done very few recordings because it's been extremely challenging to get them to work because we do everything in 3D moving mice. And, and it's a very caudal part of the brain, which has low stability for recording. But I think we absolutely need the endogenous activity. So there's, there's more on that front to do as well. So there's, there's lots of stuff that can be done. And, and the other key question for me is how do these neurons actually get these precise patterns to start with? I mean, you know, obviously this is input driven. So, so that means this, these patterns are due to the combina combined input of cortical basal ganglia, midbrain, and all that input that gives these neurons their fingerprint in, in what, how they are active. And, and these neurons are very close to each other and have a, such a completely different type of activity pattern. It must be because of what they get as inputs, right? It's sort of putting the problem one level, one level higher, or two levels, or three levels, or whatever. There was one question from Beijing. Um, what's the relationship between different hand movements? Could we decompose them into a low dimensional axis? Uh, and if so, does the neural uh, population represent a uh, low dimension? And or have, yeah. Yeah. So, so we haven't actually done much on that yet. We are we are looking more into the hand movements. We have we have been very poor. At, we've just said food handling. We haven't actually done any hand movement specific stuff. That can be done. We haven't done it. So when the animal is not moving, it can correspond to different cognitive states, like when just stopping or when the animal is grooming. Mm -hmm. During grooming, we know that there are like uh, like different kinds of oscillations happening with standing or something. Mm -hmm. So is there a distinction when we, we use uh, these neurons in, in these distinct states? I just simply stopping or grooming. You mean whether it's easier to induce when they're in the state? You, you start to induce uh, movement, so yes. it's equally uh, effective 
uh, then the animal simply stops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the animal is, is yeah. That's a, that's a that's a good question. I I think that's what we have tried is to induce the forelimb movement reaching thing when the animal is locomoting, like really strongly locomoting, and there it doesn't stop locomoting and then do this. Uh, so there is definitely some competition with ongoing activities where some of the optogenetic stimulations can't override it. But we haven't done anything systematic along these lines. Yeah, the question being uh, also how all these pathways are talking to each other and repressing or activating each other, right? Because you can't locomote and, and reach for, for a food at the same time. There's competition and, and we don't know um, how all these hundred pathways talk to each other and make sure that 99 of them are shut down, but the one is allowed to be active. And, and so that's, that's very interesting. It's essentially the problem of action selection. Um, and, and, uh, that has been classically attributed to basal ganglia, but I think actually some of it actually may happen downstream of basal ganglia still. Can I take two more questions? Is there a sense, uh, do you have the sense that it is necessary to broadly activate all neurons in a single of these subpopulations in order to achieve the, the behavior? I, I, don't, I don't think so, because our viral methods are not 100% for sure. And we usually value specificity over, over completeness. <laughs> so um, I think that, so what I can tell you is because we have quantified it, it's enough to infect 100, 100 neurons to get a, a full blown behavior, which is which is for mice, uh, it's 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 not a lot. Um, for Drosophila, it would be a lot. <laughs> to what extent is this activation necessary for accomplishing naturalistic behaviors? So, for example, like yes. is the activation of the particular reaching subpopulation yes. necessary during climbing? Or is it just that when you explicitly activate those neurons, you can generate a reaching? No, no, it is. We have actually, I didn't show you, but we have done lots of function experiments. So if you actually, if you silence these neurons in, in a, and, and then you do the reaching assay or the handling assay, they are very poor at, at doing that then. So these regions and these neurons are endogenously needed. They are endogenous. So for us, always key, I, I you know, I'm, the optogenetic activation for me is a kind of a, probe a neuron for what's possible. It's not, it doesn't mean that these neurons do that. Condition for that is, is for me that they are active during that and that when you inhibit them, uh, there is some sort of deficiency in, 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 uh, in that behavior. Because many neurons probably are not primarily there to help doing that behavior, but monitor action, right? Movement related parameters you can find anywhere in the brain, in the visual cortex is a key example. You find movement-related neurons are not primarily neurons that you need to move. These are just monitoring your movement parameters. Okay, I think we're all eager to hear more and have more questions for the for us in Basel. We'll have an opportunity to ask more questions over lunch because Sylvia is staying for lunch. But let's thank you. Questions. It was really cool. Thank you very, very much. That was great. Um, so before going to lunch, we decided that we'll have a brief um, uh, life and science panel with Sylvia, because Sylvia has a long, varied experience. So we thought it would be fun to have this uh, panel together. So please, uh, here in Beijing, prepare your questions, ask questions. We'll take maybe uh, 25 minutes, half an hour before having lunch. Um, so the, the, the way we do it generally is that